Hey everybody, it's me, it's your old buddy Steve Simonson and we're coming back again, yet again, with another Awesomers.com podcast episode. Now, this long-running series has incremented up to 171, that's right, how many hours of my free time do I give you? At least 171, that's the answer. And if you want to know show notes and details about today's episode, just go to Awesomers.com slash 171 and you're going to want to do that because we've got a special guest today, Laurel Bloomfield. Laurel, say hello. Hello, hello everyone. Thanks for having me, Steve. Certainly my pleasure. And uh, I'm, I'm anxious actually to have the Awesomers hear your story because if I can just tease them a little bit, you have invented something and then you set about to figure out how to sell that invention, which a lot of us uh, brand owners like to do. Mm -hmm. And you, part of that journey was focused on how do you get into big box? Am I framing that up correctly? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a long journey from, hey, I have this idea. What do I do with it to figure out how to sell it? And then led to the opportunity for big box retail and some large distribution. So by long process, you mean like a long weekend, a three-day weekend you invented it <laughs> right. and you're in big right. box yeah. by you Monday, build, right? You can build a $100 million company in a long weekend, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, several, several years. Yeah, I understand. Now, uh, for the customers out there who uh, have the big googly eyes about getting into retail, mm -hmm. there's some pluses and there's some minuses, and we're going to get into that in today's episode. Yeah. Uh, but before we do that, I want to jump into Laurel's origin story just a little bit. Laurel, tell me where you come from and and kind of where you had your big idea. Sure. Yeah, I am. I'm. I'm a mom in the Northwest United States, and I'm married to a cattle rancher. He's a fifth generation cattle rancher, so we live in the west and the western way of lifestyle um my husband and i had business with ranching and construction so we were always um self-employed business owners entrepreneurs to that sense um we were married seven years before we got our first child and so i really was i had dove into running those businesses with my husband and then um those are some pretty physically demanding businesses i mean ranching is you don't even get the day off on Christmas because the cows are hungry whatever day it is so um, when I had a little infant at home I found myself inside more but kind of was in that mode of I always did something I was always working and and being a mom is is a full-time job but um, I wanted to figure out the next phase of business like even just explore online business for our our most traditional businesses, cattle ranching and construction really can't get more traditional models than that. Um, so I just set out to learn. I'm a, I'm a learner and I started an online shop just to see if I could do it kind of. Um, I was selling just women's clothing and um, we had, we were selling lots of items that didn't have any pockets and everyone carries their cell phone everywhere. So we came up with an um, idea to put a cell phone in an accessory, a cell phone pocket in an accessory like um, a boot cuff specifically was our very first product that kind of spurred the idea. Um, and we put that on Amazon before we even knew what we were doing to optimize sales there and it went to number one bestseller. So the business person in my mind is well, people want pockets. We should put this, we should put pockets on everything. So we started kind of fiddling with the potential design of putting pockets that could hold your, our idea was cell phone, um, in leggings, in tank tops, kind of workout wear type stuff. Um, and then in coming up with that design, working through different ways to make it work functionally for people, um, we actually came up with a design that warranted a patent. And I think there's only four patents on pockets <laughs> ever issued because or, it's not a new idea i mean pocket patents now right let, let, yeah <laughs> like you don't let's... think you could get a patent on a pocket in a shirt because they've been there forever that's not a new idea but our our pocket in, in particular holds any contents in place minus any closure mechanisms so no buttons zippers velcro and you can flip upside down on the trampoline and your contents won't fall out wow. so um, I actually wrote the provisional patent myself because I was, we were just bootstrapping. Um, so I figured out how to do that. And while I was writing that, um, we had a few, I guess we'd call them serendipitous moments. One in particular 
one of my good girlfriends, her child was, he was an infant at the time, seven months, super sick. So she takes him to the ER. They send him home and say has the flu. Um, she takes him back a couple hours later and he has, uh, he's in a diabetic coma and he has type one diabetes. And oftentimes those symptoms are very similar and misdiagnosed as the flu. It Type one, a lot of people know it as juvenile diabetes. So you, you often see it onset in youth. It's, it's an acute autoimmune disease. As soon as you get it, it, your pancreas just stopped working. And that, that organ is vital to keep you alive. You cannot stay alive without a functioning pancreas. But with modern medicine, um, we have, you know, insulin shots, send meters, and now we have insulin pumps. So an insulin pump is like the size of a pager with like 10 feet of tubing. And um, you could have a 21 year old athlete with type one saying, this pump is so annoying, where am I supposed to put it? But my friend with this seven month old baby who they saved his life, which is actually statistically not normal. He should be gone or have severe brain damage, but he's a healthy four year old, five year old now. Um, after 10 days in a coma and getting his blood sugars balanced back out, they put him on an insulin pump right away. And past that sort of trauma, her first question was, what am I supposed to do with this pump? Right. Like, how am I going to, to manage right? this on my baby? Uh, I mean, you can imagine there is like 10 feet of tubing from the pump to the infusion site. It's the size of a pager. So on a seven month old, that's pretty cumbersome yeah but so we just, were kind of so in I, uh, laurel just so i make sure because i'm not a uh familiar with all this but my right. understanding is that pump is physically connected to the person yes the infusion site that tube goes to the person it stays yes. attached and then the pump mechanism is yeah. has to stay together right there's yeah, no you have to put it's it not in like oh i'm taking a right. nap i'm taking this off it's it no. always has to be connected right yeah yeah it's a part right. of you at that point so so well, you it's, saw this it's problem the, closest thing to replacing your pancreas is function. I mean, you still have to manually do a lot of things with it, but that's what that pump is. Like you're, it's like an external organ. They actually are working on an artificial pancreas that would do more of the functions, like read the glucose levels and read the insulin levels and dose itself and act like a pancreas. But that still will be the same. It'll be a device outside of the person, but attached to the person. So you saw this um, unique situation and, and problem, yeah. I, and then what did you do about it? It kind of opened our eyes to, wow, this is what our pocket is for. I mean, we can put anything in our pockets. Like you can put your passport and you can go running with your cell phone and you can put your ID if you are going out to the party one night, your college kid. It has all these uses, but this one has a significant pain point and need that we can solve a real problem with. So you're not going to die without your cell phone. Some people might think they will, but you, this, just our simple little pocket provides a little bit of freedom for, you know, like Levi, he's five now. So he goes to kindergarten. He can hang upside down on the monkey bars and not worry about his pump falling out. Or a girl can wear a dress instead of having to wear a fanny pack or a belt or wear pockets all the time, you know? Um, so it gives them, it's a very, uh, demanding disease and it gives them just a little dose of freedom that's so so huge for them when they're so tied to sort of this big responsibility of keeping themselves alive and so with Levi we just um, we just found the smallest pair of little underwear that we could find for a seven month old um, Jimmy rigged our pocket prototype onto that pair of underwear slipped it over his diaper and tucked in the pump and the tubing and away he went. And so he's had it pretty easy because he's had our products his whole life. And, um, but we get diabetics who are, you know, 70 years old and say, I've been trying to figure out how to do this forever. Or mom's calling us in tears saying, you know, like they, they're so busy keeping their child alive, which is, which is what most of us are tasked with, even with healthy children, um, that they don't really have time to, build a business, but they're very innovative in trying to make this as easy as possible for their kid. And um, so anyways, yeah, Levi was our first prototype in, and the response was huge. And then we just quickly reached out to anyone else we could find and 
And again, response was remarkable and it, it led to pretty, pretty easy marketing strategy, pretty rapid growth and um, some huge opportunities for us. So, so one of the, the lessons I want to make sure that I hammer home, at least from my own perspective, you sure uh, can correct me or augment uh, where you see fit here, Laurel. But, you know, I, I talk about the idea of branding. I talk about differentiation and I talk about niching down. Right. And talk about the ultimate niche down. Right. Uh, to, to, to go. Yeah, I've got this thing and it, it works for a lot of stuff. But really, we're going to focus on this, you know, kind of diabetics with a pump. Right. Right. People are like, well, I want to sell everything to everybody. And right. That's not a strategy. That's the worst marketing strategy ever. And I will get, give ourselves a pat on the back because even though we were new to this, we knew that if we tried to market to every cell phone user in the United States, we would just go broke. Like we can't compete with Macy's or Lululemon or the big brands. Um, but we have something unique that solves a significant problem. And if you can solve a problem for a group of people, it doesn't even have to be that big of a group, but type one diabetics, there's a pretty large group of people. It's, um, almost 2 million people in the U S with type one. There's, over 30 million with type two. Um, and some type twos are progressed far enough that they're insulin dependent and going on pumps. So it's a pretty large niche. But even if you have a small niche, if you have, you serve a few thousand people, you can create a good business with it. It might not be fit for major retail, but you can, with online tools, you don't want to market to everyone. It will cost you way too much money. Yep, no, I quite agree. So, so you've got this uh, kind of preliminary idea and patent and you kind of went through this process. You're excited. You saw some initial things and then you saw even this, this tidal wave of opportunity in mm -hmm. the diabetic space. Now, how, how, where did it go from there? How did you start getting this inkling that going from the online bit? And by the way, just for clarity, you, you were selling on Amazon. Were you selling on your own website as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazon and our own website. And um, we grew from there. We partnered with Tandem Diabetes, which is the number two insulin pump manufacturer in the world and distribute out through their in-person distributors of their insulin pumps. Um, is that a white label deal or is it your brand going with that? It's our brand going, which is oh, awesome. Well yeah. done for you. So uh, again, just awesomers to frame this up. When you, when you have somebody who's a logical partner, sometimes that partner, they're the big uh, dog and they'll go, no, you're just going to OEM. I'll take your your cool item, your patented mm -hmm. item, whatever it is, and you put it in my brand and you sell it to me at a cheap price, that's not a great deal. It can lead to turnover, but a better deal is how Laurel did it, which is right. she got her brand uh, working in partnership with the big brand in, in pumps, or at least mm -hmm. one of the, the top uh, brands. So, yep. so from there, then how did it evolve, Laurel? From there, um, we just got feedback from the community about how they're served um, in the pharmaceutical space. Uh, diabetics have to have their insulin. They, they'll die without it. And you can't order it online. They go in store. And um, the retail model is changing so rapidly because of, because of what we have, the tools we have online. But those diabetics have to get their bodies or their caregivers into the pharmacy. And they are right next to those shelves. And those shelves don't move a lot of product, the diabetes section shelves. And they're very antiquated. They haven't changed in 30 years and they don't have a lot of innovative products there or things that people really actually even need. You know, some compression socks and insure drinks, which you could argue are actually bad for the diabetic. Um, and so just because we were hearing feedback from our community, I started reaching out to retail buyers just um, and kind of, it kind of went with went to them with you must know you need to change up that section because these are your most loyal customers because they'll die without coming in there and you're not grabbing them they're not buying from your diabetes section that's just a whole wasted section let's innovate that and i think because i took that approach of i could do something for them i didn't just want them to do something for me like put me on their shelves but i could help them serve their customers better and I target called me back, you know, just a little ranch wife from Idaho. And it took a lot of effort. I mean, I went probably sent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages to retail buyers that I could find. And you know? how did you find them? Talk about that process a little sure, bit. Sure. I use LinkedIn. Um, and I don't really 
I don't really think LinkedIn's the best place to just do a bunch of cold messages or sales pitches. And I didn't go about it that way. I went with that with value. Like, I know you hear this a lot, but I have a product that your diabetes customers need. And I went with kind of that proposition and I sent, I sent, yeah, at least a hundred messages. I just use LinkedIn filters, um, search. So you can search a really good search terms there that you can drill down like your ideal customer connections. Um, I would never recommend someone just sends a connection request and sends a cold sales pitch. It doesn't oh. work. People scroll right over it. Um, but for me, it came around to no, actually nobody responded back, which is kind of, if you're an entrepreneur, you just have to get used to people ignoring you or people saying no, you have to kind of just have thick skin and then, but it went up the chain because there was some value there and they reached out to me and it was my, someone on LinkedIn got your message and forwarded it to my boss. My boss is interested and wanted me to reach out to you. And that's what started that first conversation. I love that. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. Be right back. Okay, we're back again, everybody. Now, one of the things I find, first of all, I love the entrepreneurial spirit of, hey, I don't know what to do. I'm going to go on LinkedIn. I'm going to just start reaching out. Mm -hmm. Most importantly, don't spam people, right? I, mm -hmm. I get spammed every day on LinkedIn mm -hmm. where somebody makes a connection and in their connection thing, they're like, hey, I want to see how I can serve your community or how I can help the awesomers or mm -hmm. how I can help the Empowering Co-op or they, they find some hook that they want to help and I'm like, hey, I'm, I, I like people who want to help. Yeah. And then the first email I get is, hey, would you buy something from me? And it's like, man, that is not the, the best approach. In fact, right. at best, I ignore them. At worst, I memorize who they are and why I will never use their services. <laughs> so that's uh, that's that a more aggressive uh, version right. of uh, buyers. So, yeah. so as you took this uh, approach and, and it kind of did its uh, thing and gestated, eventually it came back and somebody from Target actually called you and tell, mm -hmm. tell us how that deal unfolded. Yeah, that was actually also another long process. Um, I got on the phone with her and she was, it was such an eye opener to me. It was my first experience in um, even gaining any kind of insight or understanding as to how that whole process worked. And she, she took sort of an inventory, had leading questions of where I was and where my company was and um, gave me a lot of great advice and sent me on my way with some homework assignments basically. And it took me another year to like check off her list. Like you need to get this done. You have to have this in place. You need to have this ready. Um, and it took me another year. And then I called her back and said, okay, I'm, I'm ready. And she had actually moved on. Um, buyers rotate a lot so okay. she had been promoted but she sent me on to her to her predecessor and and we went from there and that process was another whole year of onboarding so all of the legal paperwork getting the member vendor id number getting um, the systems in place like electronic data interface called edi and that took a whole nother year and then um and then we launched online and then um, in retail the following spring. Nice. Well, mm -hmm. I think there's a, a few lessons in here. First of all, it, it doesn't hurt to just kind of do something, take some action mm -hmm. and, and to, to take action the, the right way will, uh, has the highest potential, but to gird ourselves for a long battle, right? This is not a, in fact, a long weekend, which I joked about earlier. <laughs> it's a long process. There ain't no getting around it. Uh, unless you have, you know, the, the latest pet rock that goes viral and everybody just got to have it. Right. You should expect this to be a long, arduous process and the outcome is uncertain. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Is that right. fair to say, Laurel? It is. It's fair to say. And I mean, the, the more knowledgeable you get about all these processes, the more you can predict what's going to happen. And, and like retail buyers at that level are really good at like looking back at that very first conversation I had with, my first target buyer um, she had specific questions that really got her to the meat of the information she needed in order to move me into you know the bucket I needed to be in you know and so if someone was further down the path than I was she could have you know given them two assignments instead of six that would have taken them a couple months and you know I think that you get better at predicting the potential success of something but 
um, it is such a long process. And really what it comes down to is the, the founder of the company, the people, the team of the company, if they can do it or not, if they can actually deliver, if they can actually get through all of these hurdles and obstacles that are going to come your way. And some people can do that faster than others. But um, I like the saying that um, an overnight success is a 10 year process. <laughs> yeah, I, I could definitely relate. Yeah. Is, uh, and it, listen, it's all relative, right? So for mm -hmm. me to go into and get a, a big box when I've been doing it for 15 or 20 years is easy. We already have EDI. We already have all the mm -hmm. stuff we need. And we walk in and they ask those pre-qualified questions. Hey, have you ever sold? Who are you selling to? What's your mm -hmm. volume? What's your structure? What's your operational capabilities? We have all the right answers. Right. But when you're starting out, when you're a, a lone wolf or a brand owner that's just kind of mm -hmm. out in the middle of nowhere, you don't have, you don't even know the questions they're going to ask, let oh, alone no. have the no, answers. you don't. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you don't mind, what, what are a couple of the questions that, that you struggled with early on? On that list, what are the types of things that... You know, the types you of asked. things that I had to get into place were um, a manufacturing pipeline that could support a retail rollout. So even if you think your manufacturing is pretty robust, it's, I mean, it's nothing compared. And Target's a small retailer compared to Walgreens, Walmart. So the, the manufacturing plan to be able to scale to a, a nationwide retail roll out was something that we really had to work hard on that took um then then the piece that kind of facilitated that would be the funding and financing so we went we did an investment round and raised several million dollars and um had um like promissory notes from people who would factor those po's once they came in so it, manufacturing, scaling, plan, um, and then funding. Yeah, so that's, it's, there's nothing, in fact, I have many cases uh, and stories uh, from friends and the like where, you know, they're like, hey, great, we finally got this giant PO uh, or this series of POs that we expect over the next six months, and it's whatever, $30 million. The problem is we have no way to finance that, right? And right. so without the idea of, factoring or, you know, or having a way to monetize those receivables pretty much the minute you get the PO without decent terms at the manufacturer to uh, mm -hmm. buy some cash flow without understanding how all these levers are moved because it's not a cash business. Uh, for those who source no. from various places uh, like China, often they're led to believe, oh, we're just going to pay in cash. Well, you, go ahead and try to get cash up front from Target. Good, good luck to you. Uh, right. I, I've right. never been yeah, able no, to do you have it. to float a lot. Yeah, they, in fact, I give them like 1% 60 days terms. They, they mm -hmm. discount it for the pleasure of paying me 60 days later. Mm -hmm. It's like a 1% discount. Uh, is that, uh, have you seen the onerous terms like that? The big boxes are the ones in control, yes? The big boxes will win. Like it's, what I tell people is you don't want to go play at that table until you can hold your own at least because Walmart's never going to lose. They don't want you to fail, which is why, why their buyers will filter you out if you're not ready, if you don't have these things in place. But if you have, it, you're doing a large volume, tiny margins play. It's a volume play and it, it's high stakes poker. Yeah, I think and, that's a very good- You can lose a lot of money. So- you know, it's, it's not something you even want unless you really do have these pieces in place. Even you could be a seven figure e-commerce business and that's not enough money to float a, a target rollout. So it's a good place to be in because you, if you've done seven figures online, then you could generate interest with investors and, and money guys that would be able to take you to that next level. But one of the things that that target buyer told me my first conversation with her, I think she stayed on the phone with me for at least an hour. I, you know, we became friends and she just gave me all, all the instructions, but she said, you would be so shocked at how many companies fail at a hundred million dollars, because if you're not ready, target will eat you alive, not maliciously. It just right. will crush you. 
Yeah, just imagine, uh, I'll try to, I, you, I know you're in the ranching, that's something to do with cattle, but I'm going to throw a farming uh, okay, apparatus yeah. at everybody. Uh, imagine those big combines just going down the field. That's, that, that's those big retailers. They have to consume and they have to put products on the shelves. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready to kind of get with the program and jump in the back, you're just going to get run over. And the reality yeah. is, again, I, I support Laurel's point. It's not, in fact, malicious. They, they All that work they put into developing you and giving you a, a, a vendor ID and all that type of stuff, they don't want to see that go to waste because that's no. all of their time and equity wasted. Right. It's bad for their numbers, but it is a possibility. So let, let's help frame up this a little bit. A lot of people want big box, but we, they should do it with caution. Is that a yeah, statement? Yeah, for sure. They should, they should position themselves first. And I think that you just don't know what you don't know. If you've never experienced it, you, you don't know. I mean, if you are, yeah, doing six or seven figures in online sales and marketing, you're really churning those wheels and you've got, you, I 100% sure you have the intelligence to figure it out, but there is still a lot of pieces that you would want to be in place before you risked that healthy business that you have just because um, there's this perception that if you get into Walmart, you're just set for generations. It's, it's not true. It can <laughs> yeah. be, but it's not true. Well, there is upside for sure, yes. oh, uh, yes. but there's, there's equal risk that goes with mm -hmm. it. And that's the point. I think you're making the points right. very well, Laurel. Um, this is, by the way, uh, a good time to remind everybody, for, it, for those who want to understand some of those questions, uh, Laurel, you offer some sort of consulting or th those types of things for, for folks out there. T talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I work with a few brands a, a year to um, take, take their business to the next level, meaning position them for a major retail or large distribution play, um, you know, kind of on a consulting, sometimes coaching level, more consulting at the, if you're close to ready for retail. Um, get get your manufacturing in place and scaled up and go through potential investment rounds and um, help with sales and marketing to those those key people that you need in place before you before you're ready for retail and then um, sometimes make the introductions if the, the buyers make sense yeah and it's a very um, fragmented world right so there's a buyer at Target maybe a series of buyers at Target that Laurel knows, but mm -hmm. if I'm selling lamps or I'm selling kitchen spatulas, they may be completely different buyers. And in fact, that I'm, they're almost- They are completely buyers. different buyers. There's buyers for every little section. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you know th that's a reality. And the fact that the buyers move around a lot, there's, there's just a lot of moving parts. But mm -hmm. as I often quote, the, the, the head of AWS at Amazon once said, uh, maybe it was three or four years ago, there is no compression algorithm for experience, right? The closest thing you can right. do to, to get experience is to find somebody with experience. So Laurel yes. is somebody who may be able to help you. How do people reach out to you, Laurel? I'm really active on LinkedIn. You can catch me there. Um, you can email me at laurel at dreamersmakersdoers.com. That's kind of a long email, but um, yeah, my, my phone number is listed on LinkedIn and, and I'm, I'm an open book, so don't be afraid to send me a connection request. I'm not scared of sales pitches. I'm like you. I'll just ignore it. Or <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. if you try to sell me, um, I think selling is great. I 100% support sales. And I, I don't mind people pitching me, but um, I'll just give a little tip. Don't pitch anyone until you have built a relationship. And if there is a win-win situation, then go for it. But if you can't identify like how you can serve each other, then it, then it creates animosity. So I think that, um, yeah, that's my little tip. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll make sure you I may be able to pitch info. me something, but miss, it's gotta be a win-win. Yeah. I'll, I'll put uh, Laurel's LinkedIn, uh, uh, link on the the page awesomers.com slash 171 uh, everybody and one of the other um, resources uh, because you know as everybody knows the uh, awesomers this is a volunteer effort on my part I also do, uh, support the empower e-commerce cooperative and you can go to empowery.org slash uh, Costco dash discovery and that process will take you through some of this stuff uh, will oh. take you through some of the ideas of what are the questions are you you know Costco is like 
a, a Mount Everest in retail. Very, very difficult. And mm -hmm. a lot of people, in fact, I would say the vast majority, 98%, are not nearly ready for Costco. Right. Uh, or Target or pick your mm -hmm. pick your big box. Right. But there there are steps that you need to take. And I love the conversation about this idea of, hey, you know, a lot of people in the Amazon space, for example, they're like, well, I just build it to this level and then I sell it. And I'm saying, yes, that's an option. That's one way to go. You can right. build it and you can just lay on the beach like uh, back here in my background. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of ways you can go. One of those is you can build it, do some fundraising and, mm -hmm. you know, bring in some investors that raises that capitalization and then mm -hmm. decide how to deploy that capital, including if big box makes sense. So uh, to me, I love the idea of multi-channel, especially if the product has, you know, a uh, big, big opportunity. Tell us, is, yeah. are you still in that business today? Are you still in the pocket business? We actually um, recently stepped away from that business and sold it. Oh, good yeah. for you. Good. I, yeah. I hope it was a good exit. Mm -hmm. uh, how, what was the lifespan of that, that business, Laurel? From idea to sale, five years. Okay, nice. Well done. Not too bad. I mean, it felt like it felt <laughs> like a big mountain, but it's really like looking back, it's not that that long. So, um, be prepared for at least five years. Yeah, I think that actually is a pretty tight timeline. So, well mm -hmm. done, you. Yeah. Uh, very, very good job. And uh, again, Ostomers, I want to remind everybody that. I know everybody thinks that big box is like the, that's the ultimate dream, right? Oh, e-commerce, yeah. anybody can do that, but big box, that's where the, the money is. And there are plenty of people really getting the job done well in retail, but For it's sure. not just the grass is greener, right? It's not just an easy thing. No. And, yeah. It needs to make sense. So Laurel, is it reasonable to say that, you know, going in with both the op, optimistic upside but the the rational awareness of the downside that's it's required to be successful 100 percent, yeah if you i mean there'll be enough gatekeepers that won't let you get there if you're not ready um most likely but i mean i had a, a gal call me and she had gotten into walmart and she she was almost full capacity nationwide with walmart and she made $4,000 that year. Like it was, and she, I think she said she gained 50 pounds because it was so stressful and she made no money doing it because she didn't have things in place. She delivered her orders, but she did not understand how and where to deploy that cash and when and um, how to negotiate those contracts so that she didn't you know, take home $4,000 for, you know, her 10 years of work, yeah. you know? So I think that you're right. Like the, you can make a really good business out of it and you can generate a lot of cash, take home cash and a good business and have employees that you pay. Well, all of that can happen, but everything has to be in place. I think you. that's such an important point and, and we'll probably uh, uh, leave it there at, at, you know, here in the moment, but I just, I have to re, I'm doubling down on Laurel's point, which is you can get the POs, you can get that stroke of luck, you can have the relationships, but without operational excellence, without the ability to execute, without the awareness financially of, of how, how all these things fit together, including at the time you quote the purchase order, right? You're mm -hmm. giving a quote without knowing the ramifications. Right. All of these are kind of cascading problems and uh, they must be avoided. Um, Laurel, I, I really appreciate the uh, time today. Uh, any you. parting words of wisdom you have for the awesomers out there? Um, you can accomplish anything you set out to accomplish. I mean, you can, if you just keep putting one foot in front of the other, you'll figure it out. Um, there'll be some crash and burns for sure. But, but like Steve said, one way to compress time is to learn from someone who's been there before. So I know that a lot of entrepreneurs are, you know, they wear a tight belt and they try to do everything themselves, but um, that would be my main, if I could go back and hire a coach or um, just those moments that I got the insight from someone who was that buyer or, you know, an investor who had made a lot of money and been there before, those little insights are, they save you a lot of money and time. So that would be my advice. Like go find someone who's 
been there and hire them. Totally. Make things happen faster. I totally agree. And awesomers, I'm not going to do one-on-one consulting with you, and but Laura will, uh, <laughs> or at least she'll consider it, and maybe uh, you guys uh, are able to strike a deal. The, the key is you don't know what you don't know, and mm-hmm. boy, it's a lot better when you know what you don't know because yeah. then you can go do some stuff about it. Yeah, if you can see down the road without having been down the road, then you'll get a lot further. Life is better. Mm-hmm. Well, listen, uh, everybody go to awesomers.com slash 171. I'll put in uh, the links to find Laurel and maybe a couple other links about our conversation today. Uh, I appreciate your time, Laurel. Thank you again very much. Thank you for thank you so much for having me, Steve. This was fun. Yeah, certainly my pleasure. Awesomers, we'll see you next time. And until then, until we meet again, I'll say goodbye. <laughs>